And I suppose people should actually be shocked that, that, that what might bring them down is the price of a roll of wallpaper, but in actually, but in actual fact, uh, there are far bigger issues around his leadership mm. and around his role as Prime Minister that could uh, arguably be far more important. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I have to plug a few quick things. First of all, my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available to order. You can read some chapter previews by following the link in the description below. Our sponsors, ExpressVPN, get 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN, and get 25% off podcast hosting with Podium. Finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go check out odyssey.com instead. We are hosting all our videos there, if you're a creator, you can move your videos across with one simple click and you can earn cryptocurrency simply by watching videos and use it to tip your favorite creators like myself. So please check that all out if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Stuart. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's very exciting to have you here. You were the first politician to ever follow me on Twitter. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, take that as a compliment. I was pretty pleased when I saw it. I was like, oh, someone, someone actually like someone who's in a position of some power thinks that I'm not insane. So that that was a nice start. <laughs> so what's going on with Arlene? She has resigned now. What do you think that means for the DUP? Well, I, I think um, maybe I should say first of all, for her, it's obviously a very difficult time, and there's a there's a human being behind all of this, and I know lots of us, me perhaps included, will take digs at other political parties and uh, and other politicians, but I think we do have to remember there is that there's Arlene Foster, the mum, the wife, um, and all of that, and she will be very hurt uh, by all of the things that have gone on, but. Um, I think it really signals the further decline of the DUP um, because if we are to believe what uh, people are saying at the moment, uh, it comes about uh, not because she has been um, too illiberal in her views within the DUP, but actually it's her liberal views. Uh, that seemed to have caused the problems for her inside the DUP. Whether it was her abstention on the conversion therapy vote, uh, whether it was her perceived um, soft approach to the Brexit debacle, which her party has landed her in, and indeed arguably she landed herself in. Um, or even, and I was reflecting on this uh, earlier on, um, in answering a question in the House uh, she about the Irish Language Act, where she basically just simply gave the facts that it was part of the new decade arrangements, that she uh, that it was being progressed. Um, and she finally quipped by saying Sinead at the end of her comment. And you know, most people would have just had a smile and thought, well, that's fair enough. But when you think about it, there are people inside the DUP who will have been horrified that uh, words in Irish uttered from her mouth mm -hmm. and that unless she'd said curry my yoghurt, uh, she really was damned by certain people in the DUP who would have expected her to follow the Gregory Campbell line rather than the decent line which she did by just simply uh, saying a couple of words in Irish. Um, so yeah, um, I think this just is a further indication of the decline of the party. Uh, it's it's circled the wagons around its hardest of lines. Mm. I mean, there was definitely a few people raising the issue on Twitter over the last day or two about what it says about the DUP base when they will, or whether they're happy to oust Arlene Foster as leader, at, being that the straw that broke the camel's back seemingly was this abstention on the vote on conversion therapy. And yet they were just sort of okay with the potentially, I think it's half a billion pounds estimated of, of wastage um, on RHI caused through arguably either corruption or incompetence. And that's all right, but this seemingly 
minuscule cultural issue is is the thing that that drives her out do, do you think that that points that it's these cultural issues that are most important to the base at this point for some of them it is and i can think of a number of mlas who cannot see pop beyond uh, those issues and any perception of going soft on them uh, will be why she's in the situation that she's in that and you made reference to the argument the argument around the competence over RHI and the mess that she got the party into and that famous admission that she wasn't over the jot and tittle of everything. Um, and the same has to be true of the Brexit negotiations as well, that she and Nigel Dodds effectively fronted up for the party with with the with Theresa May and with Boris Johnson. Um, that anybody could have believed uh, that a single word that Boris Johnson made by way of a promise to them was somewhat naive. Mm. Um, their failure to see that Theresa May probably as a one nation Tory did actually have some concern for the interests of Northern Ireland uh, going forward. But the DUP hardliners within the party, predominantly in those circumstances, uh, amongst their group of MPs, uh, just simply were not prepared to do that. Some of them uh, obviously pressed the Great Britain when it came to the competence and supply funds. Mm -hmm. uh, others, uh, quite simply, uh, wanted to go for the absolute hardest of hard Brexits. And we saw the sort of company that they were keeping, the Farages and the banks of this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah the, the, I'm not sure how they believed they were going to be honest. I, I, I don't, I've never seen any indication from the Boris Johnson administration, even really from Theresa May's administration, that, that they were keeping us in their best interest, or well, they were keeping us in their thoughts and, and hoping to make the best of Brexit for Northern Ireland, uh, as opposed to needing the votes. I think realistically, many of them would have been very happy with no deal. Mm. I, I, I get the feeling you're probably correct there. I mean, I had I had Julian Jessup on, who's from the IEA, about ooh, three years ago, and he was trying to you know, extol to me the virtues of how wonderful No Deal could be, um, and I was not convinced. <laughs> and I read a whole book with someone trying to convince me, and I was not convinced. No, I, I don't think No Deal was a convincing situation, but equally well, a No Detail deal mm -hmm has been equally problematic for us. Uh, Boris, if, if, if Arlene wasn't over the jot and tittle of RHI, it's quite clear that Boris was not over the jot and tittle of a Brexit deal either. Um, and the reality is that it is a very flawed and very botched deal. I think it's also fair to say that while we have the very acute issues around the protocol for Northern Ireland, they are actually no different from any other communities in the rest of the United Kingdom. You only have to listen to, for example, uh, the fishing community and the way in which they believe they have been completely screwed over uh, by the Conservative Party. Um, you only have to look at what's happening in the road haulage industry. You only have to look at the amount of paperwork that people have to do. And that paperwork just doesn't apply in Northern Ireland. Uh, to get from Calais to Dover is a is a is a similar problem from getting as getting from Stranraer to to Larne. Mm. So, uh, speaking of the the protocol and the the border issues, does do you, do you think that that's the reason for for the violence that we saw over the past month or so, um, with you know, people setting fire to buses and bins and throwing petrol bombs at the police. It was all a bit too 90s for, for my taste. But um, <laughs> do, you think, do you think the border is the legitimate reason for that happening? Or do you think there's something else causing that? I think there's a great deal of frustration in uh, so-called loyalist communities uh, that feel that they have been marginalised and left out. But then some of that is understandable. We've had a three-year gap in the Assembly. Uh, when during those three years a great deal of work could and should have been done uh, to work and develop um, working class communities, to improve our education system, to improve our health system situation. I appreciate we've come through and we didn't know at the beginning of the, the, the mandate of this assembly that we were going to face into a pandemic. Mm. But nevertheless, those three wasted years uh, could have been much more could have been used much more to the benefit of the communities that feel so frustrated today by the protocol. Mm. What specifically do you think could have been done to that that say they had 
taken these actions over the past three or four years would have led to this many people going out on the street and deciding to protest for for whatever reason? Well, I think people are being used very cynically to, to, to do this, and there, there, there are a variety of layers to this. There is undoubtedly, there are undoubtedly people who are disturbed and concerned about the Irish Sea border. Um, but those tend to be people who, for example, are not supporters of the Good Friday Agreement either. Um, so this is just a continuation of their protest and opposition to that. Um, there are also very local issues around all of this as well, and you're sitting here in East Antrim, uh, where we have the notorious South East Antrim uh, paramilitary uh, uh, people. Um, and what has been happening has been that young people have drifted away from these paramilitary or criminal gangs. And um, I believe that, that some of what has been going on has been uh, criminal gang leaders have been recruiting young people into um, the type of, of drug dealing and money lending uh, activities that, that they, that they that where they, their source of income happens to be. And you just take um, some of those young people who unfortunately got caught up in the rioting or petrol bombing or whatever they were criminality that they were doing. Many of them will now face a life of, with a criminal record. That limits your employment opportunities, it limits your travel opportunities, it limits a whole range of opportunities in life. And it allows the drug dealer and the criminal gangster to knock your door and say, well, you're not going to have a good job, you're not going to have opportunities, but I can do things for you if you come and work for me, if you will come and deliver drugs for me, if you will come and be my enforcer for uh, 50 quid loans on a Friday night. Um, so, unfortunately, we are seeing young people being drawn back into this type of criminal activity. Um, and some of that's what's been going on. So do you think that these the, the people that we see out on the street are genuinely concerned about the ins and outs of the Northern Ireland um, protocol or the border issue? Or do you think this is just an excuse Seriously. to lash out? I seriously doubt that, and you're right, it is a lashing out. Some of it also will have to do with the lockdown and COVID. Mm -hmm. um, How much do you think that is? Well, there's a mix of things out there. I mean, I've been calling, for example, for um, what are called detached youth workers to be more seen on the streets. And that's been very difficult because of COVID. But we, for example, here have had a number of issues around uh, the railway line, uh, where young people, for some reason, have decided that uh, railway stations are good gathering points. And traveling on the line from as far away as Larne all the way into Belfast, getting off at stations, causing problems, um, ha ha have been problematic. And that's been a sporadic problem that we've had in this area for quite a number of years. But it has also been very well dealt with by detached youth workers working with police and other agencies. Um, we've also seen traditional youth clubs and other youth activities, after school activities. All, none of those things have been happening during COVID. Uh, and therefore, um, there is a build up of frustration in young people whose normal outlet will be everything from football to uh, youth clubs to other sporting activities. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely been a tough, a tough thing for people who would, yeah, th most of those kids, I think someone commented that normally they'd just be playing football on a Friday night instead of Absolutely. throwing petrol bombs. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we get back to, to, to that. And we need to. I mean, I, I see, I, I can see and testify to, to the advantages of that in this community. I mean, I, I live in Green Island where we've got Green Island Football Club. There are somewhere in the region of a thousand young people, boys and girls, come together on a weekly basis to play football, to, to enhance their, their soccer skills. It's a very big operation. Uh, most of all of the people who work as trainers and leaders in that uh, work brilliantly with young people coming in to do that. It's a massive cross-community activity and it just simply stopped during COVID. Now I know they've done lots of social media and online stuff for the youngsters that, that are involved, but there is no substitute for being out on a 3 or 4G pitch, mm. kicking a ball, extending your skills. Mm. 
definitely not. When when we got to the point last year around, uh, what was it, the 15th of March, 16th of March, whenever whenever there, there was, I think that's when the first lockdowns were imposed yeah. or, or something around that anyway. How much discussion was or how much consideration was given to the fact that you were going to take away people's civil rights and, and liberties and the things that have generally been considered what is the definition of the developed world? Yeah. Uh, like how, mu how much consideration was given to the fact that that was being taken away? Well, um, I think for some of us in politics, that weighs very heavily. For others, it was just simply a matter of um, they were very happy to be able to enforce those rules. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is no doubt that uh, the public health rules, and remember that's, that's where all of this stems from, are public health regulations, many of which we simply haven't had to use for probably the last 50 plus years um, because we haven't had a serious public health issue like COVID before. Um, probably the last major public health issue was something like polio mm. uh, back in the, the late 40s and early 50s in the United Kingdom. And even then, uh, the public health rules around of that were very different. And of course, the general public were perhaps much more compliant when it came to the government imposing rules uh, on society and on communities. So I know people like uh, Naomi Long leading us in the Alliance Party has expressed a lot of these views inside the executive and they are views which exercise us very much. But of course, we've got to balance that with the whole issue of the public health and the need to protect public health and most importantly, uh, the need to protect our health service because if that became overwhelmed, and sadly, and, it's very distressingly, we're seeing the exact outworking of that in India at the moment. We're seeing hospitals completely and utterly overcome. And without exaggeration, that is what would have happened here had we allowed this pandemic to, to become rampant in the community without taking any action. But the actions which we've taken have proved very difficult in balancing liberty and freedom along with the, the need to protect uh, our communities, to protect people's jobs, and most of all, to protect people's health. Mm. Now, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with um, the, the measures that have been taken over the last year, and I'm reluctant to retrace those arguments because they've been had a thousand times. I, I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts on things moving forwards now. Um, so obviously the, the, the whole reason for all of the rules that were put in place was um, like a, a balance of risk for to try and protect yes. um, the most vulnerable in our society, yes. the elderly, the sick. Um, and I think what, what's on a lot of people's minds at the minute, and mine as well, is that we've taken this level of risk down um, by a serious magnitude over the past two months or so with the amount of vaccinations that yeah. have been rolled out. And it seems that we are being as cautious or if not more cautious now than we had been previously in, in sort of winding down things when this seems to be the point at which we should be saying, go, like, get back to your lives. You've all waited a whole year. You've done a great job. You've, 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 you know, taken, taken some really hard things in, in your stride, like lack of social contact, not being able to see friends and family, like it's been a tough year. And it feels like we're being more cautious now at the point when we could be saying, okay, we've the vaccination program has worked excellently. The NHS has done a great job. Um, you know, even even Chris Whitty, the 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 UK, um, I don't know what his exact title is. He was he said that outside is no problem. Um, essentially, unless you're in a large crowd, there shouldn't be a risk of transmission, even for unvaccinated people. So why are we now seeing, for example, in Belfast, places like the Sunflower or the Dirty Onion, who have taken on new staff, who have um, bought stock, brought people in to clean up, and now two days before they're meant to open are being told that it's not up to scratch? That okay. Yeah, that kind of feels like yeah. it's... And of course, these are public health um regulations, these are emergency public health regulations that are being used in these circumstances and that, that does cause me an element of unease. Mm. I, I'll be absolutely uh, frank about that. 
We need to be moving away from these draconian public health regulations, right though they were to use during the most crucial moments of the pandemic, mm. but they need to be kept under constant review. And if that is daily or weekly review, so be it. And the health minister needs to understand, and, 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 and as do the scientific advisors to the health minister, they do need to understand that they are using powers which really uh, the community has accepted, but will not accept once we start to move out of this pandemic. There are issues around um, th th this issue of the bars, and it's very much of the moment. In fact, I was dealing with a local uh, hotel here this morning on that very issue. Mm. There are two aspects to this. I do understand that um, there are public health COVID aspects around it, and my understanding is that that is now being changed back to what it was, and that those people will be able to open tomorrow. Oh, really? Well, if, if they want to. Um, okay. But I understand that, that perhaps there's been uh, some mixed messages going out around the public health uh, COVID aspect to it. There is one other issue around it, and that's to do with the licensing laws. Those landlords or, or facilities that have opened up additional space that is problematic because if you're if you own a pub mm. uh, or or have an alcohol license, the, the area, the places that you sell the alcohol actually have to be specified in your license. So if you've identified the backyard of your pub as somewhere that you want to open up, mm. actually you have to extend your license in that area, and that is a legal problem. So there are two issues going on here. One is around the sort of environmental health. Um, public health COVID stuff mm -hmm. and I think that can and has been resolved and will be resolved later today okay. but there's a second issue and that is around additional spaces that are not currently licensed for the sale of alcohol and it may be that people hadn't appreciated that if you extend into your backyard uh, or, or, or into the car park um, maybe, you, maybe you block off half the car park with a marquee or something like that that isn't a licensed space and you need to have your liquor license extended to cover that. That's problematic because you have to submit designs, you have to submit uh, health and safety uh, arguments for that, you have to submit uh, fire safety and it has to have the approval of the PSMI because it falls under the liquor licensing laws and they are very strict very stringent and unfortunately they take a long time to work their way through. As as I know, speaking to a local hotelier here this morning, although they made their application to extend a space under their liquor licence some months ago, they can't actually get a date in court until June. Oh, uh, bureaucracy is uh, difficult sometimes. It is, well, <laughs> of course we are actually reviewing, reviewing the liquor licensing laws in Northern Ireland. Really? It may very well be one of those things that, that should now be reviewed in that in that overall review. Okay. Yeah, the liquor licensing law review is quite interesting um, and there are a wide range of issues around that at the moment. Uh, it's around everything from time to late licensing to um, the type of premises that can be licensed. One of the areas that I have a particular concern for are what are called tap rooms. So if you have a, a here in East Antrim, we have uh, some really interesting uh, businesses that have started up as small breweries, small distilleries, and um, the best you can do if you arrive as a tourist is you have to take the tour and you will get a small sample. But I would quite like to see, as in the rest of the UK, that simply if you go along to somewhere like Nakata Brewery, Nakata Brewery mm -hmm. that you should be able to just simply uh, buy and, and drink their product on site. But at the moment, the law doesn't allow you to do that. So they can make the beer and ship it out to people, but they can't actually sell it to you at the premises? Correct. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, sometimes the way laws get built up is... Uh, it's frustrating. I guess that's that's something that that people are, especially young people. Uh, from from my perspective, is that a lot of the things that seem to us to be just why is it like that or why can't we change that? And the 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 way that the assembly functions seems to be antithetical to progress in 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 many ways. Do you, do you see any serious reform happening of the of the the government structures there? Uh, 
mainly the mandatory coalition, I think, is the well, big one. Yeah, around that aspect. Now, there are two aspects. One is around the mandatory co coalition, and the other is around simply how we how we legislate. Uh, and I and I would like to actually develop the argument around how we uh, can either fast track legislation or how we can speed up the change in legislation, like something in the, the licensing laws, because the change in the licensing laws is a once in twenty year opportunity. And it may be, you know, and if we don't get it right now, the likes of Lakata or other uh, home breweries or distilleries could be locked out of the ability to expand and grow their business mm -hmm. for the next 20 odd years. But going back to, to uh, the, the, the arrangements within the Assembly, uh, for us in the Alliance Party, one of the key areas, of course, is around designation and the fact that we don't count. My vote doesn't count in a cross-community vote mm -hmm. inside the Assembly. And um, uh, currently, uh, for example, we could not hold the office of first or deputy first minister within an assembly because Wait, there's really a, no, there's a sectarian card that can only go to a unionist or nationalist politician. Yeah, right. Actually, that that that's shocking. It is. Shocking. Has no one considered that? Especially now that Alliance or the last poll had you only one point behind the DUP. That could and there's like a, a good point. swing in the there next election. A, there's a serious and real prospect of us uh, moving towards one or other of those two key offices within an executive, uh, but at the moment it would require a, le a legislation change, it would require primary legislation, and that can only happen at Westminster. So wait, hang on, that has to happen at Westminster? Yes. So Northern, the Northern, Northern Ireland Act, Act, would, are Northern not... Act would require an amendment. Right. So I hadn't even considered this as a possibility, so we would require some action would would it require like an act of parliament like amendment or could, would it could it be done through like some sort of like secondary legislation it would be or? secondary legislation we would have to be led by the secretary of state and obviously the prime minister would have to be involved and it would have to be fast tracked through westminster because we could be sitting in a situation where we where the alliance party party could be sitting with the votes and the members of the assembly but the inability to fill that office or one of those offices have you spoken to the secretary of state for northern ireland on this or one of the previous years okay <laughs> yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I think they're they're trying to plug a few gaps at the minute. <laughs> the amount of uh, the amount of corruption stories that have come out in the last week are even shocking. Given that I believe Boris Johnson to be the most corrupt man to ever hold the office of prime minister, um, it's yeah. I mean, I will. Like, <laughs> I think I could prove it. <laughs> if you give me a bit of paper in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I suppose people should actually be shocked that, that, that what might bring him down is the price of a row of wallpaper, but in, actually, but in actual fact, uh, there are far bigger issues around his leadership mm. and around his role as Prime Minister that could uh, arguably be far more important. And that was the whole issue of herd immunity and the appalling comment if he made it about let the bodies stack up. Remember, whether he said it or not, he is the Prime Minister who at the time promoted the, 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 the whole issue around her immunity. And there are people who are highly distressed both by the loss of family members through COVID, uh, which may have been preventable deaths had we acted much sooner in relation to the pandemic that we're in. Mm. And the thing that what may bring down is the price of a rule of wallpaper. Um, is interesting, but that's politics for you. I mean, it shows you what the British public find criminal. It does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the let the bodies pile up comment. If he made that, it's uh, it's highly offensive. Yeah, but the the problem is that if you if he was trying if you're trying to make like a, a reasonably like well put together case for say targeted measures rather than like blanket lockdowns or the idea that perhaps we should be like trying to let younger people or kids have as much of their normal lives as possible. And it ruins your point when you come across that callous. It really irritates me because I think there are legitimate arguments to be made in that sphere. And then people like the prime minister <laughs> making comments like that makes it so difficult to then try and have an actual discussion about that because it, when the person pushing it is that callous about it then you, you, you how do you have a serious conversation yeah. around that and we saw him effectively i suppose at closest 
losing his temper in the House of Commons yesterday. Maybe that's what Keir Starmer was trying to do. Mm. I don't know, but he certainly used his very uh, cool, calm, uh, QC voice in the House yesterday. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what he provoked was uh, probably the closest that some of the public will have got to see in terms of an angry and uh, Boris. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, he was far less jovial than he normally is. Yes, I think that's true. And clearly, I, I think there's something there. Uh, something has been hidden there. I, I don't think the Electoral Commission, which is not an organisation that they particularly carry a torch for, but uh, it is their role, and I'm glad that they're doing it. Um, and certainly, if you read into what they have said, it, it definitely looks that they, they there, there is something worth investigating there from them. But... I wouldn't hold her breath on it because it took them what two years to 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 investigate some of the um, boat leave campaign stuff, and in the end, a couple of minor apparatchiks ended up being wrapped over the knuckles for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, we'll not, we'll not go too far into that. But I, I went I went very deep in that in my book, so it's uh, it's difficult. If you want to find out more about that, go order my book. Um, so. Will the Alliance Party be backing the idea of, of vaccine passports? Again, that's a very uh, interesting area. We certainly will not be supporting a vaccine passport internally in the United Kingdom. Uh, I don't think that that is either fair or reasonable. And it, uh, it, it has all of the abilities to both discriminate and also in uh, Boris terms to be another disaster administratively anyway. Mm. But I think we do have to face up to the reality that it may very well be uh, for those people who wish to travel that they will need to be able to identify the fact that they've had a vaccine. Or whether you want to call it a vaccine passport or whether you want to call it something like a yellow fever certificate because if you go to certain countries in the world you are required to prove the fact that you've had vaccination for a whole range of, it, of, of illnesses and there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to add COVID-19 to that. And it may very well be a requirement uh, in both directions both countries may require us to be able to prove that we've had a vaccination when we travel there. And equally well, I would like to think the United Kingdom will require citizens from other countries coming into the United Kingdom to prove that they have been vaccinated as well. Mm -hmm. That is one way uh, to um, ensure that international travel can both happen and happen safely. Mm -hmm. Do you see that being a permanent thing? That, I think, is dependent on the future of COVID. Um, and I, so therefore, if you take things like uh, yellow fever, uh, smallpox and other diseases for which there are internationally standard travel requirements, mm. if COVID gets onto that list, then it probably will be. But if, co if we can beat COVID in its entirety, then absolutely not. I wouldn't want to, to see the fact that I was inoculated 10 years ago or whatever. Um, being a requirement going into the future, but it has to be science led. And if you're going to places where the risk re remains, then I think you, you need to be able to prove that you've been vaccinated, yes. Okay. So I um, have been doing quite a lot of research at the minute into um, decentralized finance and Bitcoin, cryptocurrency and whatnot, um, because I find it very interesting, um, because I have a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> Um, because Dogecoin made me two hundred pounds out of nowhere, and um, then uh, upon doing some research, I came across the, the this proposal from I think two or three years ago for Belfast to have their Belfast coin. Is that has that been shelved entirely? Do you know? Is that is that something that's gonna gonna happen coming into the future? Don't get your hopes up on calling it Belfast coin. Okay, uh, all it is is a Belfast City loyalty card. It's just like your Nectar Point card. Okay. Um, that, that's the reality of it. It is a city-wide loyalty card that when you shop or take services from Belfast City Council that go for a swim or go to one of the leisure centres, you get points and points mean pounds or points mean services or points mean a gift of something like that. It is not a stock market out there investment in Belfast. It is simply a city-wide loyalty card. Uh, it sounds very grand as the, but the reality is it is just a loyalty card. That's not to suggest that it doesn't have its advantages. Um, and for example, here in East Antrim, we've seen a very much smaller version of that in terms of recycling. Again, an area which I am 
both passionate about and an area which I think is very important. So if you go a few miles up the road in the white head and you take your plastic bottles or your glass bottles uh, either back to a shop or ultimately to a recycling machine and you put those in and you put your card in, you will get some money uh, based on your ability to recycle those. It's a concept that happens in other countries and it's being trialled here in Northern Ireland, specifically in, in Whitehead. So essentially glass and plastic and it's through the retailers, so it's, it's your bottle of Coca-Cola or um, whatever the drink or product happens to be that you've bought. Um, that when you recycle it, you'll get a, you'll get a deposit or, or, or some of money back in relation to it. So it requires shops to be able to do that. But Electronics now they make that very simple through the barcode system, and um, you, you collect your points when you when you responsibly recycle. Hmm, that's cool that we're going to have that here, or we have had that already. We have it in an experimental form of Whitehead. So if you go down to Whitehead now and buy a bottle of a drink, a fizzy drink, uh, you will pay a deposit on the bottle, and you put it in the machine. Uh, when you've finished it, you'll get your deposit credited back onto your card. Oh, that's nice. I mean, they have the same thing in, in Austria where I lived for a little while um, with ca like cases of beer. Yes. So you bring back the whole case and you get like five euros back yep. on the price of the beer. It's fantastic. Yeah. You know, it contributes to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> next one seems much cheaper then, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I think those sort of things or those sort of schemes are very good. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I have was chosen to do that. Mm. Center of the universe, I've heard. Absolutely. <laughs> so what do you see the outlook for the, the future of the Northern Irish economy over the next um, six months, 12 months, two years? Uh, we've had yeah, a lot of impact from, uh, from COVID. We have to see how the hospitality, tourism, the high street all recover. Uh, how do you see that, that play and, are you, and, and how do you see Brexit impact in said recovery? These are very important questions uh, for the future, not only of the businesses that you've talked about, but also for, for Northern Ireland going forward. Um, COVID has brought about very drastic changes on the high street with shops here closed for months on end, businesses curtailed, a massive change in business, a move to online shopping, um, click and collect services. Um, all of that has been have been massive changes for the public to take in, some of which the public have embraced, some of which the public can't embrace because they, they're not online, they don't have laptops, they don't have smartphones and they don't have the ability or the skills to be able to manipulate their way through uh, online shopping or um, click and collect type services. So there will always be a need for uh, direct the direct ability to do your shopping, uh, whatever that happens to be. Mm. So there are lots of changes out there and incredible opportunities, of course, as well. And we should see our high streets perhaps transformed as a result of where we go after uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, we have seen and will see incredible changes in terms of our broader economy as a result of Brexit. And I, I genuinely believe that uh, the protocol has advantages because we're sitting here still with all of those rights that we have within the EU. Now, I decry the fact that I can't have any influence over the laws and rules of the EU. I want to be, I want, I wanted us to remain. I make no bones about that. But I am pleased that from a business perspective, we remain inside the EU. And we also have the advantages of being able to trade inside the United Kingdom as well. We need to work our way through the problems of that. And there are solutions to it. I know, for example, people like Stephen Farry has been working very hard on things like what they call the, the there's a Swiss model where effectively, as a, a we the if the United Kingdom were to agree to follow those trading rules with the EU, then there would be no uh, the protocol barrier simply wouldn't exist for us. Uh, those are problems which the UK government are going to have to resolve um, and there doesn't seem to be much appetite for that. But Northern Ireland is in a unique, a unique situation and we should be doing everything possible to encourage businesses both in the UK and in Europe to use Northern Ireland as a place and a po point of entry for both the United Kingdom market and to be able to trade from the island of Ireland uh, right across uh, the whole of the European Union. Um, the downside of that is the attitude of currently the largest party, the DUP, 
Uh, they have done everything possible to make the protocol or to persuade people that the protocol is bad. Mm -hmm. I don't see the protocol as being bad. I see it as being a barrier at the moment, but it's a barrier which, if we worked on, has incredible potential and opportunity for us. Mm. Now, to wrap up, could you perhaps give us a case for why young people should have any kind of faith in in Stormont to to be a, a a governing body that is is worth maybe not supporting but giving your vote to participating in the system because something that I've heard from uh, countless people um, of my age over the past yeah, year or so has been. I can't believe I'm getting a science lecture from the DUP. And it, <laughs> and it just but issue issues like that again and again where they don't they don't have any respect in any way for for, for what happens at the assembly. The for most of my generation like it's seen as like a clown show, especially the main two parties. I mean, the Alliance party is is one of the few that that I can actually say I'm pleased to see adults in the room um it's 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 refreshing to see people being sensible um amidst madness and sectarianism and just the whole spectacle of our political show but why should the young people tr believe that it's possible to take storm and, and turn it into a functioning executive government body that can you know improve the lives of the people of northern ireland i think if you see devolution as a positive, I passionately believe that devolution is a positive. Mm. Um, it's a positive in Scotland, no matter what direction they wish to go in. It's a positive in Wales. It should be a positive in regions in the rest of England. It is a positive in London, where there's an assembly mm. uh, with not dissimilar powers to, to ours. Um, most people seem to forget about the London Assembly. Um, there are there are tremendous opportunities and advantages with devolution. It gives us much more local control. Now, you're right, uh, people look on in despair at those people you might describe as clowns or difficult or not willing to move. Um, but that's not to suggest that you're right. There are adults in the room. There are people like Naomi Long and others uh, in the Alliance Party uh, who present those rational arguments uh, that impinge on everyday life and uh, for, for us here in Northern Ireland. Um, and in, in order to enhance the voice of young people, I back and have backed very strongly a campaign in Northern Ireland until I vote at 16. Um, I think that's right and proper. I'm sh delighted that young people in Scotland and Wales, when they come to their elections, in later in the next month in May, that they will be at the age of 16 able to vote for their AMs uh, or their their, their uh, members of the Scottish Parliament. Really? Yes. Okay, I did not because know it's a, that. Because it's, a, know because, that? It's a, because it's a devolved issue. Um, the national government has decided they will not do that for, for national elections, um, but we could do that here in Northern Ireland. We could have votes at 16 for young people for assembly and local, local authority elections. How much hunger do you think there is for that amongst 16 to 18 year olds? Well, I have been to a raft of, uh, pre COVID, I've been to a raft of, of events with young people. There is a there is a very strong and strained and lively campaign to deliver votes at 16. Um, in the voluntary and youth sector across Northern Ireland, um, they're, they're, those voices are very strong. Um, the assembly is just about to set up a youth assembly, uh, something which we haven't mm. had for some time. We've had ad hoc youth assemblies, but we're now going to put a youth assembly into the standing orders of the assembly, which will allow uh, young people to come together four times a year, similar to the to the national youth parliament. Um, and so, yeah. Young people will engage with democracy and young people will engage with Stormont if they feel they have a stake in it. And the best stake you can have is to be able to vote. That seems like a fantastic place to leave things on. So, Stuart, thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. 
get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.